The road back to the birthplace of coffee isn't easy. Parts of it are underwater, and you won't find a single sign along the way. But you can't miss the giant billboard when you get to the town of Bonga and the enormous coffee pot. Walk into the surrounding forests and it's everywhere. Coffee, forest coffee. It's been growing wild around these parts for thousands of years. There are big, very big trees there mm -hmm. in the forest. Local legend has it that goats were the first ones to get a kick out of coffee. Over a thousand years ago, it's said, a young shepherd boy named Kaldi noticed that his goats were behaving strangely after eating cherries from some of the trees in the forest. Coffee trees. The rest, as they say, is history. It is consumed by millions, and the people in little Bonga town are quite proud of that. Soon, they'll even have a new museum to showcase their fame. It is very important for the country and the world, he says. I am proud it originated here. Misarat Haile runs the local coffee shop. It is my life, she says. I am very happy a museum is being built to promote our market and that this is the home of coffee. Her little stall is nothing like the exclusive coffee shops in the West, and you can get a shot of espresso here for the equivalent of about five cents. Can you ask her if she's ever heard of Starbucks? Starbucks for me, by the way, I'm Not a single specialty coffee place to be found. No souvenir tourist traps either. In fact, you could drive right through Bonga and not even notice anything special about it. And there's something else. Bonga may be famous because it's the home of coffee, but ironically, it doesn't produce a lot of coffee. And that reflects a national trend in the world of coffee producing nations. Ethiopia is way down at number 10. Because in Ethiopia, small scale farmers do the growing and they just can't compete. The government is working with USAID to change that. I think the potential of coffee has just barely been tapped here. And so there's a lot more potential to exploit on marketing of specialty coffee as well as commodity coffee here. So USAID agronomist Gitacho Zaleka travels deep into coffee country to educate farmers and promote the idea that bigger farms are better. Quality is improving, but farmers complain they still aren't getting enough money for their coffee compared to other countries. By Ethiopian standards, Gedeberhe's coffee plantation is big. The question we all ask, he says, why don't we get the same prices that Kenyan farmers get? The answer, according to the experts, Ethiopian coffee farmers are fragmented and disorganized. They have no leverage when it comes to getting higher prices. Worknesha Maka has a family to feed. We are not encouraged by the price, she says. What is the point of planting good coffee? We might uproot them and plant corn, she says. Over in the east, in Harar, a place with a famous coffee name of its own, many farmers are coming to the same conclusion, only it's not corn. It's cat, a mild narcotic. It is highly addictive and popular in Ethiopia and in many other countries in the region. It grows very well here. The cat markets are everywhere. As you can see, it's a busy place. Difficult to say exactly how much money is exchanged here every day, but it's roughly in the thousands of dollars, and that's the problem. Here in Ethiopia, it's much easier for farmers to make money growing cat rather than coffee. Isak Abele has been growing coffee in Harar for 20 years. It's not so good nowadays, he says. The return is bad. Most people are turning to cat. Half of what he grows now is cat. But the coffee industry remains number one in Ethiopia and the government is determined to keep it that way. Quality control has been intensified. The thinking is it will help ensure farmers get the best price for their product. 
For World Focus, I'm Martin Seemungle in southwestern Ethiopia.